Thanks for uh, having me uh, uh, give this talk here. It's, uh, I'm not in Sochi, I'm in Belgium. Weather is fine over here. Um, and um, let's see, my talk will be about Hermit Pade approximation and the number pi. Uh, it's not going to uh, give any new results, uh, but I will uh, explain some of the recent results about the rationality measure of pi. Uh, and that this is related to hermit pade approximation and multiple orthogonal polynomials. You see, the people in, in number theory, in this area of number theory, they have these beautiful proofs, uh, but you don't really know where they come from, these proofs. Uh, and I'm going to undo some of the magic, and I'm going to explain their magic tricks and explain that there is some hermit pade approximation behind it. I will try to analyze this Hermit Pade approximation in a little bit more detail as n tends to infinity. Uh, but unfortunately, I will not give any new bounds for the irrationality measure of pi. Uh, <clears throat> OK, so let's first explain what the irrationality measure is. And, and by the way, uh, the, the connection between Hermit Pade approximation and number theory is really going back to the roots of Hermit Pade approximation because Hermit really invented Hermit Pare approximation to prove that the number E is transcendental. So here I will uh, explain something how it is related to uh, the irrationality of pi. Now, the irrationality measure of a real number X, uh, it measures how well the real number can be approximated by rational numbers. And <clears throat> here is the definition. So I have the, uh, the real number X. I'm going to approximate it by rational numbers A over B. And if I can do this at order uh, R, so if this is less than one over uh, the denominator to the power R, and there are infinitely many such uh, A, B, uh, then I have a very good uh, rational approximation. Uh, the bigger R is, the better the approximation uh, by rational numbers. Uh, <clears throat> but and I want to find the biggest one uh, that gives you uh, such a good uh, approximation. That's the supremum. And that would be the measure of irrationality. So what do we know about the measure of irrationality? Well, for rational numbers, it turns out that the measure of irrationality is equal to one, uh, because you can never approximate a rational number uh, strictly by other rational numbers. Uh, because the smallest uh, error over here is one over Q if X is equal by the, to uh, uh, P over Q. So that's why you get one over there. And then you have a discontinuity. If X is irrational, then the measure of irrationality is greater than or equal to two. And you can actually achieve uh, approximates of order two by taking the convergence of a continued fraction. Uh, if X is algebraic, then uh, a famous result by Roth from 55 says that the measure of irrationality is going to be two. And this is really a non-trivial result because Roth got the Fields Medal uh, for this result over here. Yeah. And for the well-known number E, the, uh, the basis of the exponential function, the measure of irrationality is equal to two. And E is a transcendental number, so uh, Two is not uh, reserved for algebraic numbers. It can actually also be true for other numbers. Basically, almost all numbers have irrationality measure two, uh, but you can achieve any number between two and infinity. Uh, so what we will do is try to find some upper bounds for the measure of irrationality. And I will use this kind of a lemma to obtain an upper bound. Uh, it's going to be by constructing rational approximants, Pn over Qn, at certain order, if we can find approximants uh, like this, uh, at this order where the denominator is an increasing sequence, but it's not increasing too fast, uh, then uh, the measure of irrationality will be bounded from above while one plus uh, one over R. So this R over here. Um, I will, uh, this, this result is, is an exercise in the book by uh, the two Borgwines on pi and the AGM. Uh, but I will use this result, which was uh, uh, given by uh, Hata, which shows that uh, you need some end root asymptotics of the denominator uh, and of the uh, error of approximation over here. So if you can find this end root asymptotics 
with a number a for the denominator, which is bigger than one, and a number uh, one over b, which is less than one uh, for the uh, uh, error in approximation, then the measure of irrationality is going to be bounded from above by uh, one plus the logarithm of this number a uh, divided by the logarithm of this number b. So this already shows you that we need some nth root asymptotics uh, to give this uh, uh, upper bounds. And I will start with a, a simple uh, exercise. I'm going to prove that pi is irrational, which is not a new result, of course. Um, but uh, to my surprise, uh, it is in very few textbooks, the uh, proof of the irrationality of pi. And it's even lacking in most of the university courses. Even though uh, we tell our students that pi is an irrational number, uh, we hardly prove it. And here's a proof that fits in a first year calculus course. So you consider this integral kn uh, with this uh, uh, rational function over here, uh, integrate from minus one to plus one, the uh, numerator here as a zero at, at zero and a zero at one and minus one. And the denominator is this uh, complex thing over here. It has a pole in the number i. And then uh, if, if you work out uh, some examples, you find that the kn is this linear combination of pi with these rational numbers a and b and c and well a and b and c and are actually integers. And then you need to do a little bit of number theory uh, to figure out that the a n and the b n are divisible by this power of two and uh, that the cn divides the least common multiple uh, of the numbers from one to three n and the three n comes from this three n over here. Uh, uh, but that the cn uh, contains no prime factors between three n over two and two n. Uh, and so this is a bit of number theory that you need to use, uh, but the rest is going to be uh, asymptotics. Uh, so uh, what we're going to do is going to multiply the a n and the b n by uh, an integer d n, and I'm going to divide away this power of two. And this integer d n is going to be this least common multiple of the numbers from one to three n, uh, in which I remove all the primes between three n over two and two n. Uh, and then uh, this uh, integral k n multiplied by that number is going to be of the right uh, form. It's an integer times pi minus uh, p n. So p n over q n is a rational approximate to pi. And uh, then some simple calculus, you look for the maximum of the uh, integrant on the interval minus one to plus one, it's this number over here. And you need some elementary number theory to prove that the nth root of this uh, integer dn goes to the exponential of uh, five uh, over two. Uh, the, uh, this you've proved by using the prime number theorem of uh, the lavalier poussin and Adamar. And then uh, it turns out that uh, uh, this quantity over here, if I take the nth root, that would be the nth root of this one, uh, is actually going to converge to this number uh, times this number divided by square root of two, which is uh, a number less than one, uh, so that uh, q and pi minus p n is going to go to zero exponentially fast, which is impossible if pi would be rational because if pi is rational uh, a over b, uh, this quantity will always be greater than one over b. And so it can never go to zero exponentially fast. So this is a pretty nice proof. It uses some number theory. I always put it in blue when I'm using some results from number theory, but all the rest is simple uh, approximation uh, of uh, 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 quantities. Uh, this proof, uh, is, is uh, suggested by a paper that uh, Fritz Berkers wrote in 2000, uh, where he explained the irrationality measure uh, of uh, uh, the Japanese mathematician Hata. Uh, and uh, I will show you that it is related to... Uh, так, sorry, to... Technical problem. Shall I wait a bit? Zoom. There are still some technical problems in Sochi. Mm. 
Ну, пропал. Из аудитории. Да. Получилось. Получается не очень. Поэтому решили, что What's the problem? You can't hear the speaker? It is set to continue. Can I continue? It, said, it says on the chat. Okay, in that case, I will continue. Okay. Um, so remember that the integrand contained this uh, uh, expression over here in the numerator. So if I take this polynomial, if I take the n derivative of this polynomial, then I will get the polynomial of degree 2n, uh, uh, which satisfies uh, this orthogonality condition on the interval 0, 1. And this orthogonality condition uh, on the interval minus one zero. So it's actually uh, a multiple uh, orthogonal polynomial on the Angelesco system, and I call it an Legendre Angelesco multiple orthogonal polynomial. Uh, <clears throat> so let me use now as uh, uh, functions for the Armid Pade approximation these two Markov functions. It's the uh, still just transform on the interval zero one and uh, the same on the interval minus one zero. Then the hermit pade approximation problem uh, says that you can approximate F1 by uh, Qn1 uh, over Pnn, and you can approximate F2 by Qn2 over Pnn. So you use a common denominator, and uh, the order of approximation <coughs> will be uh, one over <coughs> n plus one. Uh, n and this uh, numerator Qn, you can express uh, with the usual formulas in terms of the common denominator, but integrated on zero one, uh, or on minus one zero. And the error of approximation can be, can be given by these integrals involving the uh, common denominator again. So <clears throat> where can we find pi? Well, with these functions uh, f1 and f2, if I evaluate them in the number i, uh, it's some simple complex integrals, uh, you would get this linear combination of the logarithm of 2 and pi. Uh, and over here, uh, the same thing, but it's negative and uh, complex conjugate. So if I get rid of the logarithm of 2, uh, I just add uh, these two values mm -hmm. and I get this uh, number pi. So if I apply my Hermit Pape approximation problem uh, at the point i, uh, I would get uh, this kind of a result. And here it is nice to have a common denominator. Uh, mm -hmm. And so the error of approximation is given by this one. And then uh, if I apply uh, the uh, Rodriguez type formula for this uh, uh, multiple orthogonal polynomial uh, n times, uh, I would uh, shift the end derivative uh, to this rational function over here. And I would get this expression uh, for the error of approximation. And this is almost the integral Kn that we were using earlier, except we were using 2n and 2n over there and a 3n over here. So we need to do a little bit more. And first I'm going to shift the n to 2n and use uh, all these. Uh, derivative uh, uh, polynomials over here. Uh, and then I'm going to take n extra derivatives with respect to z, uh, because that will give me this uh, factor over here. The z is only appearing over here. So uh, the n derivative would give me this n factorial uh, and this factor. And then apply the Rodriguez formula and use integration by parts two n times uh, to get precisely uh, this integral which was exactly the interval Kn that was suggested by Burkers. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the message is that this integral is really the error of uh, Hermit Pade approximation after taking extra uh, derivatives. And then we can uh, do uh, some uh, identification of the uh, numbers uh, in this approximation. So the An turns out to be the nth derivative uh, of my. Uh, uh, multiple uh, Angelesco polynomial, uh, evaluate at the point i. If I use the Rodriguez formula, uh, I need to take uh, the two n derivative to get the polynomial, and n more derivatives, I would get this three n derivative of this expression. 
And then I can use some complex uh, analysis, the Cauchy theorem, to express this uh, uh, derivative uh, as an integral of the uh, function uh, uh, with a pole over here with a higher order. So then we get 3n over here because there is a 3n over here. Okay. So with this a n is now a contour integral. So I'm getting interference from Sochi. So um, with this integrand over here, and remember the integral itself, so the error of approximation was the same uh, integrand, but now integrated from minus one to one. Uh, so for the a n and for the k n, we get the same integrand, but different contours. This is a contour uh, circling around uh, the number i. Uh, and then we can do some asymptotics on the a n and the k n, uh, because these are integrals that are easily uh, uh, analyzed using the steepest descent method and the saddle point method. It's a, a function g of x to the power n. So you just look for the saddle points, the function, the points uh, where uh, you get the saddle over here. Uh, so this is the uh, function g that I'm taking to the power n. Uh, I look for the derivative and put it equal to zero. Uh, it turns out to be a polynomial of degree three divided by uh, some powers over there. Uh, so that polynomial of degree three has three roots. I'm just listing them here. You don't need to uh, recall them. Uh, and then uh, uh, what you do is I'm going to uh, deform the contour uh, around I to a contour that goes through one of the uh, saddle points. And, and this would be uh, the biggest saddle point. Uh, and, and then uh, the nth root of the kn will be given by that function g at the saddle point. Uh, and uh, this quantity over here, if I take the nth root, is going to give this part over here. So that would give me my 1 over b. For the a n, uh, so actually uh, I'm mistaken over here. For the kn, I'm using uh, these saddle points. So I'm uh, deforming the integral from minus one to plus one to an integral that goes from minus one to plus one and through these two saddle points. It's for the a n that I'm using uh, uh, a contour that goes through this saddle point. That's why I get x1 over here. And for kn, I can use either x2 uh, or x3 because they are just uh, uh, asymmetric with respect to each other. And then with this a and b, if I put it in the formula, I would get a measure of irrationality of 23.2606, which is pretty high, but at least it's finite. Uh, so this is just the idea. It uses uh, just some plain asymptotic metrics from complex analysis and some uh, hermit pade approximation, but it also uses some number theory to get this factor over here, uh, which is a little bit uh, different area. Now we can improve on this one. And the uh, first improvement was made by uh, Masatoshi Hata, Japanese mathematician in, in 93. So remember that the Berkers paper was from 2000. He was actually explaining this proof by Hata on a simpler case. Hata uses this uh, integral over here. It's an integral over a contour and the integrand now as zero in one, two and one plus i and a pole at zero. So I like to shift everything by one uh, so that uh, the zeros are going to be at zero, one and the imaginary number i and the pole is going to be at minus one. The contour is going to connect uh, the points in the numerator, uh, zero, one and i. And <clears throat> Again, one can show that this integral is a, a linear combination of pi with numbers a, n, and b, but now they are not uh, rational numbers, but the a, n is going to be a, a complex uh, integer, and the number b is going to be a rational complex integer, a Gaussian integer. And, and in order to make this b, n also a uh, complex integer, 
I need some uh, number theory again, which was uh, done by Hatta. Uh, there is some uh, integer dn such that the dn times bm becomes a complex uh, integer. And some elementary uh, number theory shows that the nth root asymptotics of the dn is going to be this uh, expression over here, which is about 10.5. And all the remaining things, the A N and the B N S and the asymptotics, <coughs> sorry, uh, can be done uh, using saddle points. And with this A and B that you get over here, Hatta achieved the upper bound uh, 8.01, which is much better than the 23 that we had before. The hermit Padet problem now is to use this marker function from zero to one. And the other one from zero to i instead from, uh, from minus one to zero. So you move everything into the complex plane. And by moving into the complex plane, uh, you can actually improve the results. And I'm going to evaluate uh, these uh, two functions at the point minus one, which was the pole. Uh, the reason why we use minus one is that the integral in minus one gives me for the first function uh, the logarithm of two with a negative sign. And for the second function, it gives me uh, this logarithm of two divided by two and uh, the imaginary part contains pi. So again, we want to get rid of the logarithm of two. So we consider this linear combination. We can combine the hermit Padé approximant for the linear combination uh, and get this thing over here and the error in the hermit Padé approximation problem is now going to be partly uh, an integral from zero to one for this one and an integral from zero to i for this one, but I need to take this twice, okay? Uh, and now that the common denominator is going to be given by this type of Rodriguez type formula for this polynomial over here, and it will satisfy orthogonality conditions on these two uh, intervals, one real interval and one complex integral. It's not Hermitian conjugation, it's just uh, uh, this kind of uh, non-Hermitian orthogonality. Uh, so we can identify the a n now uh, to be the n derivative uh, of that polynomial, but now uh, with multi-indices 2 n, 2 n, evaluated at minus 1. Uh, so the Rodriguez formula already gives me a two n derivative uh, for this one and n more derivatives gives me this three n derivative. So again, I can use the Cauchy formula to express this as a contour integral uh, of this rational function. And now you see all the two n's appearing and the three n in denominator, whereas the h n is going to be the same uh, integral, but now over different contours. And again, we can look for the saddle points of this function. There are now three saddle points. Uh, I will use uh, this saddle point, the x1, to uh, deform the contour for a n, uh, so that it's still going around minus one. Uh, and I will use uh, uh, this one uh, to deform uh, the contour from zero to i. And I will use the third the saddle point to deform the contour uh, uh, for this integral. Uh, and in this way, I will be getting uh, all the asymptotics of the a n and the h n. Turns out that this integral is going to dominate. So we only need uh, uh, this uh, saddle point over here, the x2. Uh, and the nth root uh, is going to be given by uh, this number. And the nth root of the h n is going to be given by this number. So this is bigger than one. This is less than one but we still need to modify uh, with this uh, uh, number uh, dn uh, over here. So we need to multiply by uh, 10 everything uh, and you would, oh, sorry. And that would give me precisely uh, this bound uh, that Hatta obtained. Okay. So multiplying by 10 over here still gives a number less than one. So that was uh, okay. Uh, so this multiple orthogonal polynomial that Hatta was considering, even though he doesn't mention it explicitly, it's implicit in his proof. It satisfies some third order differential equation 
from that third order differential equation, you can actually prove uh, that this kind of uh, 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 rational function converges to uh, function H, which is going to be the Stilges transform of the zero distribution of this polynomial. And that H satisfies a cubic equation uh, of this form, uh, where you would recognize this factor over here coming from this factor from the differential equation, uh, and this factor over here coming from this factor in the differential equation, and the two over here coming from uh, this factor over here. Uh, and uh, one needs to study uh, the branches uh, of that uh, algebraic function to figure out where the zeros are going to be of this uh, uh, multiple orthogonal polynomial. And I made a picture over here. Uh, so even though uh, we have orthogonalities from zero to one on the one interval and from zero to uh, uh, i on the uh, imaginary part, the zeros prefer to choose another contour. Uh, uh, and in fact, they follow uh, this quadratic differential over here, uh, and they follow this quadratic differential over here until they meet, and then they decide to join the third branch point zero over here on the third quadratic differential, which is this straight line. So there is an extra branch point. There are three branch points that you expect, zero, one, and i, uh, but there is an extra branch point over here uh, that comes uh, because of moving everything into the complex plane. Okay. Now, uh, the result of Hata was improved by a, a Russian mathematician from Bryansk, uh, uh, Salikov, and he was using uh, a much more complicated integral, um, uh, writing it over here, which has a, a numerator, which uh, is zero at uh, uh, five points, uh, two complex points here, two complex points here, and a real point five over there. And it has two uh, poles at zero and at 10. And the path of integration uh, goes through these two complex conjugate points and passes through the point five over here, which is the, you know, the point over here, this zero. In fact, it doesn't really need to go through this point as uh, you can deform the contour as uh, much as you want. But I prefer to, uh, again, change variables. I'm going to shift everything, everything by five. And if I do that and I can combine uh, these two and these two, and they will uh, get me this term over here, uh, this will become y. Uh, and this combined will get me uh, this term over here. And these two, if I combine them, I will get this uh, factor over here and then still use a quadratic transformation, uh, y squared equals to t. Uh, and then the integral becomes this one, which looks much better, uh, which would uh, look much more like the Hatta integral, but with different points in the numerator and a different point in the denominator, okay? Uh, a new thing that appears over here is the square root of t that I have. So this, uh, is a proof from 2010. And uh, the hermit pade approximation problem is now to use these two uh, Markov type functions. Uh, now an integral from zero to minus three plus four i and from zero to minus three minus four i of uh, one over z minus t, uh, but uh, I use as a weight function uh, one over square root of t here and one over square root of t here. Uh, if you evaluate these functions, if you work them out, you will get the arc tangent evaluated at these complex numbers. Uh, but if you take for z uh, the number 25, which is 5 squared, uh, you will actually be getting the arc tangent of 1 half and the arc tangent of 1, three, uh, one over 3. And this uh, identity uh, that the sum of these two is actually pi over 4, uh, will uh, <clears throat> make that uh, this F1 evaluated at 25 is this linear combination again of logarithm of two and pi. And here the complex conjugation of that one. So again, we get rid of the logarithm of two, 
by subtracting uh, the two, we have a common denominator and we use now uh, the 3n to get the 3n in the uh, top. Uh, and then you can use uh, a Rodriguez type formula to express this one again. Uh, and uh, you can identify the qn once more uh, as uh, a contour integral, but now around the point 25 of an expression that contains the two zeros at minus three minus four i, minus three plus four i and zero, and the pole at 25. But we need some integer dn uh, to have integers q, n, and p, n over here. So the dn again is going to be, uh, oh, sorry, it's on the next slide. Uh, uh, some result from number theory. I, I need to, to, to choose this dn as a power of five, uh, a power of two, and some number that involves the least common multiple of all the numbers from one to five n, of which I remove certain primes. Uh, and the nth root asymptotics is going to be given by uh, this number, uh, which is that blue uh, number over there. Uh, but all the remaining quantities, uh, this uh, contour integral uh, and this integral uh, can be done by using the saddle point method, so uh, ordinary complex uh, approximation. So the saddle points are now the zeros uh, of this uh, function. There are three saddle points, two complex conjugate saddle point and one big one. I'm going to use the big one to... Uh, <coughs> find the asymptotics of uh, this contour integral. And I'm going to choose uh, these two uh, for the asymptotics, uh, sorry, uh, of uh, the uh, Sn integral. And what you will find uh, is that uh, you improve the upper bound for the measure of irrationality to 7.6. So you just play around a little bit with the uh, the endpoints of the Markov functions and with the point where you're going to evaluate, you use some uh, formulas for the arc tangent uh, to express pi and you end up magically to this number over here. And then the uh, <coughs> polynomial that we're using now, <coughs> it uses this extra square root over here, uh, which I have to modify with the square root over here. But this multiple orthogonal polynomial uh, again, satisfies a third order differential equation from which you can again find uh, that this expression over here converges to uh, a function which is algebraic satisfying this uh, equation. Again, you would recognize uh, this factor coming from uh, here and you would recognize this factor uh, coming from uh, here uh, and uh, if you look at the quadratic differentials for functions uh, uh, in, uh, involving the, uh, the so solutions of this cubic equation, uh, you would get uh, this quadratic differential over here, and you would get another quadratic differential over here. And the third one is going from here along the real line and uh, until it meets uh, this common point over here. And the zeros again prefer to stay on this differential uh, but it wants to go to the branch point zero over here and the same over here. Uh, so uh, it's a nice uh, structure or, or where the zeros are going to uh, evolve to. And then uh, the last step uh, in the, I have two more minutes, actually a few more. Uh, the last step in the analysis or in the game of trying to improve the uh, uh, upper bound for the measure of irrationality was by Zalberger and Zudilin. And Zudilin is in the audience, so I have to be careful with what I'm saying over here. Uh, but they returned to the uh, integral uh, which was considered by uh, Salikov, uh, but they introduced some parameters A uh, in the numerator and the parameter B and the denominator, and they try to optimize the A and the B so that the Zn uh, is going to be uh, minimal, taking into account the uh, uh, possible primes uh, uh, that you need to uh, fix everything, to make everything D of n time. 
the Salikov integral corresponds to a equals to three and b equals to five. But using some computer algebra, they find the recurrence relation for the zn. And, and then they, you can analyze the asymptotics uh, using like the Poincare theorem uh, and <clears throat> giving the asymptotics of the uh, zn. Uh, they discovered that uh, the values a equal two and b equals three actually give better approximants. Uh, and they uh, achieve uh, this upper bound. So you go from 7.6 to 7.1, which is still far away from two, uh, but at least uh, uh, it uh, <coughs> has become uh, a very effective uh, uh, approximate, uh, measure of irrationality over here. So I can close now uh, with my summary and the conclusion. Uh, my conclusion is that the integrals appearing in the proofs that I showed before by Hata, Salikov, Zalberger, Zudilin, and also Berkers, uh, they, these integrals, they don't just drop out of the sky. They are actually formulas for the error uh, in uh, type two hermit Pade uh, approximation. Uh, you need to choose the functions uh, for your hermit Pade approximation problem carefully, so that if you evaluate them at some integer uh, and you take a proper uh, linear combination, you get some uh, uh, an expression for pi. And then you can do the asymptotics of hermit Pade approximation to get part uh, of the uh, asymptotic analysis. Uh, and you can do all this asymptotic analysis using saddle point method. Uh, one, of course, could use the Riemann-Hilbert approach uh, <clears throat> for these uh, multiple orthogonal polynomials, <clears throat> but this is really using much more than one need because you only need end root asymptotics. You don't need the very much stronger uh, asymptotics. Uh, a drawback is that you really need some diophantine properties of the numerator and the denominator uh, and some elementary number theory uh, to uh, uh, fix everything. So that's why I put everything in blue, uh, but it's some combinatorics. You just have to figure out uh, which are the common factors that you have to get rid of. Uh, and the uh, end root asymptotics basically uses some prime number theorem. So, uh, and in fact, uh, I, I believe Zeilberger and Zudilin uh, wrote recently a paper uh, that the search for an optimal upper bound can very much be automated using some computer algebra and some uh, uh, optimization uh, problems. So this is basically what I wanted to say, and I think I did it in the allocated time. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Walter. Very nice talk. Um, uh, is there any is there any question from the audience? I have I have a question. Okay, yes, already go on. Go ahead, Walter. What is your conjecture about uh, this measure of uh, irrationality of pi? Well, very likely it's going to be two, <laughs> because uh, almost all numbers have two. But there is a possibility that it's going to be bigger, because if you look at the continued fraction, the regular continued fraction of pi, uh, you find at a very uh, uh, <clears throat> at a subsequence that uh, the denominator suddenly gets very high uh, numbers in the continued fraction. And so it's likely if you just restrict your, uh, the convergence along this uh, thin uh, subsequence that you can get a good rational approximation. But unfortunately, we don't have explicit formulas for the continued fraction expansions. Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh... Is there any other question? I can't. I can't see uh, if, if if there's anybody uh, wanting to speak. So just go ahead and. No, no question. Okay. Uh, no question from Sochi. Okay, so let's thank the speaker. Walter, thank you.